everybody and welcome to our fifth international episode of our podcast Millennials. So today's episode will be once again in colors of blue, red and white. It means that our new guest speaker is French again and he's a third French in our podcast. So allez les bleus! <laughs> Hi Simon. Hi. Uh, really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I have to admit that I, I, I really do love French people. But there's uh, one French thing that I like even more, and that's French fries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Feda. <laughs> and what about what about French kisses? <laughs> I like I like them too, but I eat my uh, French fries with alioli, so there's no kissing after that. <laughs> well, I, I love alioli as well, so I wouldn't mind. But <laughs> let's keep going. Our new guest speaker, so as I said, is the third French in our podcast. The first one was Miss Mayot 2020. The second one was our champ Alex Kaiser guest and today young and handsome Simon Bernard. Hey Simon, well young, I mean you are young, but when Carolina was stalking you on Google, we found <laughs> out that you were born in 18th century. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how's life? I mean you've been alive for 300 years. I look very young, but I'm not that young. I mean I'm 30 years old, so <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I'm just also, I'm just joking because. But uh, I look younger. Yeah, you do, you do. But uh, I was just joking because when we were researching you, we found a French general who is your namesake. Oh yeah, there is another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. There are quite a lot of people uh, with my name. That's a with a common name. But there is a famous one yeah, born in the 18th century. <laughs> and that guy, he was fighting in Waterloo, and now you're fighting in plastic pollution. So you have something in common. And, uh, you know, not only that you are a namesake of a general, but you are also one of the 30 under 30 uh, Forbes France selected people. So congratulations, Simon. Thank you. And uh, just to explain for our listeners, the Forbes France 30 under 30 ranks and rewards 30 young people under 30, entrepreneurs, athletes, creators, engineers who have emerged or are emerging in their sector. And as I'm doing calculations in my head, then is we still have like four, five years to become 30 under 30 in our small city, uh, Malacki in Slovakia, I think. Yeah, more or less. But I don't, I don't even think there's 30, 30 under 30 people living in, <laughs> in Malacki. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, don't worry. I, I will create the category for the two of us, yeah, okay? We'll, we'll be sitting there alone. <laughs> So enough of fun, <laughs> now let's get to Simon. Simon, so as we said before, you're one of the 30 under 30 uh, most influential young people in France, according to Forbes. And uh, I would like to ask you, because previously we had a champ in kitesurfing, Alex Kaisges, and he described what is a perfect kitesurfer. But I would like to know what are the characteristics of uh, somebody who's becoming 30 under 30. Is there some, some selection criteria or how does this work? Uh, I, I would say, I mean, it depends because there are people from a, a lot of different fields and areas. But uh, as for social entrepreneur, because I, that's how I see myself today, I think you need to be very determined because, uh, well, that's, a, that's quite a hard work to make a project like that. And you have uh, lots of problems every day. You, you encounter problems. So you need to be determined and you need to not listen to people saying it's not going to work mm -hmm. uh, and keep on going, being optimistic. Also, I think that's, uh, I think you need to be enthusiastic uh, and determined. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the key ingredients. And how did it feel when you, when you got the, how did you, how did you learn actually that you were selected uh, to be one of the 30 under 30? Uh, well, actually, directly the, the day they announced, uh, not not before, they just announced it on the social uh, social networks and didn't know it about. So I just saw the the post on Instagram. So you just got a notification, <laughs> and you were just like jumping. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I, I, I was quite uh, happy with that because. Well, I, I, when I saw the rest of people, there were quite famous people with me in this list. Uh, so yeah, that was a good recognition for me. No, it is a huge achievement and also it must be a good uh, promo or advertisement for your project. It is, it is definitely. And as uh, yeah, I look young and again, I'm young, so it's always good to have credibility and to have some sort of 
labels or recognitions like that. So yeah, can help a lot, actually. I'm pretty glad. <laughs> so Simon, this is actually why we are here today. Why you are here today, it's because of your new project called uh, Plastic Odyssey. And so the key words of your project are three years of expedition, over 30 step stopovers and 40k nautical miles to reduce plastic pollution. So Simon, just please explain us and tell us right away in a pretty simple words, because we are simple people, what is the project about? <laughs> Basically, it's an expedition around the world, as you said, uh, not to clean up the ocean. Uh, we have a boat, a 40 meters long vessel, that is an ambassador of uh, the fight against plastic pollution, but it's not cleaning up the ocean. And I will explain you why uh, later on, but the, the main goal of the vessel is to showcase simple technology to recycle plastic and to spread and uh, share the, these technologies everywhere. Uh, in countries where there is a lack of access uh, to waste management. So exactly the source of plastic pollution, uh, countries in Asia, in Africa, in South America, uh, and to share in open source technologies that can recycle plastic to make local resources and help people make a living uh, with the waste locally. That's the, the idea. So recycle plastic pollution while creating uh, new jobs, right? Exactly. That's good. And also, why Plastic Odyssey? Because actually I was thinking about it a lot. And is it because of the epic Odyssey and the hero Odysseus? In French, it's called actually Ulysse. So did you name it like because of this? Well, it, it, it is. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly how we found the name, but, uh, but <laughs> I think it's a pretty cool name. <laughs> And it, it tells about uh, what we are doing. It's an odyssey, you know, it's, it's um, a, a voyage uh, to fight against plastic pollution. It's also a voyage to uh, around the world to discover new solutions um, and new ways to fight against this uh, big issue. So, yeah, I, I think it, it really summarizes well the, what we are doing with Plastic Odyssey. But I can't, I can't remember how we, we found that. It was like five or six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it could be really funny if you say, yeah, it's because of the, you know, the Greek mythology and I'm the hero. It's Odysseus, you know, I'm the hero right now. I'm Simon. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Simon Seus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I know, I understand that you cannot remember the name, how, how that came around, but maybe you could tell us how a big project like this comes around. You know, how did you and your team uh, got the idea to create this uh, this project? Sure. So, yeah, it all started in 2016 when I, I was originally, I, I uh, graduated from uh, the Merchant Navy Academy. So I used to, to sail uh, as a, uh, an officer on commercial vessels like container ships or ferries. Uh, and in two, and 2016, I also took part in an expedition on a very small catamaran uh, called Nomad de Mer, and we were working on low technologies. So ways to um, democratize solutions, to have access to water, to food, to energy uh, in the poorest countries. And I took part in this expedition. I went on the boat, on the vessel from Morocco to Senegal. And that's basically when I arrived in Senegal that I saw all the plastic that were everywhere in the city, but also the ingenuity that you have because the people can recycle everything there. Uh, that's the, the, the country of recycling, I would say, Senegal. You can recycle cans uh, to make uh, aluminum cans um, to make dishes. You can uh, recycle wood, steel, but not plastic. And I thought, well, if we can democratize simple solutions to recycle and, and use this material, uh, we can also avoid it to, to stay on the floor and to be transformed into something new, into something valuable. So that was really the starting point, this uh, first stopover uh, and also what the approach we had with Nomad des Mer, working on low technologies, uh, working on open source, so sharing knowledge, uh, instead of uh, having patents. And that, that was all this um, experience that was the, the roots of Plastic Odyssey, I would say. So when I came back from that, uh, I talked with uh, Alexandre, 
who, uh, who was also a uh, I mean, a friend of mine and also officer. And we started to think about this project and then we met Bob uh, and now we are three uh, co-founders. <laughs> and he's, yeah, and that's that's his real name, actually. <laughs> Funnily oh. enough. I'm sorry. Enough. I really like the name. I'm not laughing. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that's, that's uh, quite a simple, easy, easy name to remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. We can get a little biblical, I think, because your ship is sailing just as Noah's Ark was uh, sailing in the in the times of crisis. And, uh, you know, Noah's Ark was made out of wood, but I believe that you, <laughs> you're not uh, you're not uh, sailing a wooden vessel, but uh, you, you have uh, you have some some uh, technology in, on the boat. And you were saying that uh, the vessel is to showcase uh, some sort of uh, technology. Could you maybe tell us more about the functioning of the boat and the technology that you you're, or is this is this a trade secret? <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not because you, it's actually open source. So we we want to share as much as possible all the solutions. And what we, I mean, the, the boat is more a platform for us to transport and showcase solutions. So it's it's not uh, the the final goal is is not the boat. It's just a tool, uh, a great tool because it tells a story and it can you can uh, invite people on board, uh, live on board, use the technologies. And so basically what we have developed and what we are continuing to do because we still uh, have some work on that, but we try to develop technologies to uh, first sort the plastic because there are different types of plastics and you cannot uh, just melt them together. So you need to sort, then you need to shred it. So we have a shredder that turns waste into flakes. And then we have different steps to melt the plastic and create new objects. It can be uh, beams, it can be tiles for the roofs, it can be bricks, um, plastic sheets. I mean, different types of uh, objects and products that will answer a local need. That's all, that's the, the goal every time. And you can adapt the technologies to, to create different objects. Uh, you can even make, I know, a bike uh, out of that, uh, out of recycled plastic. Uh, and eventually when the plastic is not recyclable, uh, you can turn it back into fuel. So with one kilogram of plastic, you can make approximately one liter of uh, diesel and gasoline. So that's all also something, a, a technology we are working on. And we, so we have uh, approximately 10 machines on board. Uh, so all the different steps uh, to turn a waste into something that has value that can be sold and, and then have a, a, a small social business. I read about the roads being made of plastic as well. So does it work like this as well? You, you can actually also make roads, you can make um, pavement tiles. And that's actually the, the technology is not the, the hardest uh, thing to do. The most difficult is to find the business model. So what, what are you doing with the plastic waste? What kind of product uh, that will answer a need and that will not create another waste. So that's the, the challenge. I mean, there is a challenge developing low tech uh, and affordable technologies. That's one thing, but that's not the most difficult. Really the most difficult is what are you doing with the technologies? And so that's also something that we will do on board. We will work with local communities in each stopover to experiment and find new ways to recycle plastic. So, so one of the missions is also not to not to only collect and uh, and show uh, how how this can be done, but also to create new job opportunities. I think you were mentioning it in one of your previous interviews. Uh, you were giving the example of Egypt, yeah, if I remember correctly. And uh, so maybe you could tell us a little more about that. Keros is a, a quite an amazing example of what can be done uh, at this scale, at, at a human scale. I mean, it is still the informal sector, so. Um, the work conditions are not good at all, but that's still a good example of uh, what kind of process, what kind of product you can make. So basically what happens in now today in Keros, uh, there are 70K people living from uh, plastic recycling and, mm. and managing approximately 60% of the waste in Keros. So that's, huge like in france for example it's only 20 percent 
of plastic that is recycled. And in Cairo, 60% thanks to this community, informal community, living from waste. And, and what they are doing, it's families and each fam family businesses actually, and each family business has a specificity. So there is one uh, collecting the waste, uh, door to door to collect the waste from, from people. And there is another one, another family sorting the plastic another one shredding, another one washing the plastic. So each one has uh, a, a part of the value chain. And in the end, you can make products, uh, uh, semi like finished products. Uh, and, and they all live and they all make a living from it. And that's what's, what is uh, quite beautiful, I think. Okay. Now I have a very serious question. Yeah. <laughs> Where does the poop go? <laughs> Where? Does it go to the ocean or you burn it as a, as a fuel? Uh, yeah, 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 it goes to the ocean actually. <laughs> okay. After being treated by bacteria, we have like a sewage plant on board. But that's that's like that. <laughs> that's like that on every every vessel. That's not particular. <laughs> but yeah, it goes to the ocean. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm from Slovakia. Some months ago, I took a ferry between two Canary Islands and uh, I got super seasick in... 50 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, the sea was rough, <laughs> but uh, you know, we don't have, we don't, we have only light. <laughs> I have never been on the sea, so I don't know this. <laughs> I am seasick also sometimes. Simon, your boat is so small when you compare it to the size of the ocean. It's always safe uh, to have a ground under, under your feet, you know. How are you going to prepare for those two years of expedition? I mean, you, if you're seasick or when some people, you know, have like cabin fever, how are you going to cope with all those problems? Well, uh, I'm not sure how, but uh, we will see when it happens. <laughs> some pills. <laughs> yes, yeah, you, you can have medicines, stuff like that, but it's not, usually it's not, it makes you feel dizzy. So yeah, there is no miracle solutions. You need, just need to wait. <laughs> I think one or two days, but uh, yeah, that's a big problem. But eventually we, the action is on shore, uh, ashore, so we won't sail a lot, probably one third of the time. So The rest of the time you're going to talk with local communities, right? Yeah, the rest we will use the vessel as uh, a demonstrator, uh, invite people, invite entrepreneurs, and also use all the machines as a fab lab to experiment uh, new new solutions so it's 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 really like a mobile plastic laboratory that's how we see the boat it's very cool so you're bringing some solutions but at the same time it's the research and development exactly yeah exactly on the field because we can have like this uh, research lab in france but if we don't work with local communities then we won't find solutions adapted to the country we're going to so we really need to not to come with solutions but just to come with expertise technical expertise on recycling and then work with people that know the country obviously more than us and give them the expertise and the technology so that they can develop the solution them themselves adapt the principle that's the idea another question that i'm really excited about because with dennis we are really thinking about it like did you prepare for the pirates in the east of africa yeah it's actually west of africa now it's not ah, it's the west okay <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's now it's in uh, Guinea, like Gulf of Guinea. But it used to be east. Yeah, the that's a big question. Actually, we we will avoid the the areas at risk, but there are quite a lot actually uh, areas everywhere. So so what's the plan? Actually, like, do you have like an emergency plan or something? <laughs> Um, yeah, when when it goes a bit uh, dangerous, you have um, like you put some wire uh, around the ship. You put also, uh, you know, firehouses. Well, there there are some stuff you can do, but to be honest, the boat <laughs> is not going fast. It's quite low on the water. Uh, and it's French, so we we are at at risk a lot <laughs> of piracy. So we we will try to avoid. And eventually, if we if we really need to go through these some areas, we can we can bring like people like armed uh, people on board. That's something you, you you can do. And we I hope we won't have to, but maybe you should. <laughs>
yeah if if we have to if we have to to go through these areas we we probably will work with people like that it's the dutch jurisdiction i think the dutch navy is the is the only active jurisdiction in the world that is fighting piracy they're making use of the universal law right and uh, and they're they're prosecuting and fighting fighting uh, piracy in international waters well i think there are quite a lot of countries yeah yeah fighting against and that's that's how actually the east of africa is is not at risk anymore uh, i mean that's low risk because uh, there has been uh, countries army fighting against but now it's it's more west and it's a shame because obviously it's a lot there are a lot of countries in west africa with a lack a lot of problem in terms of plastic pollution it's it's in those countries also where there are problems with piracy so it's it's a shame but we'll pray for you yeah <laughs> maybe maybe we can send you a parrot <laughs> and a book <laughs> and, a, and a millennials ipad yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> simon uh, i was i was listening to one of your interviews and uh, you said that you have gone from uh, let's clean up the ocean to let's turn off the tap of the source Uh, can you explain uh, this change of your goal and uh, why, how did it how did this happen? Before we created Plastic Odyssey, we we were passionate about the ocean. We heard about uh, action to clean up the ocean, so we were familiar with this kind of uh, projects and and the issue of plastic pollution, but we didn't know really what it was about. And when we started uh, to look deeply into the the topic then we we, we read articles scientific articles and we, we realized that the plastic is simply not floating so uh, there is nothing to clean up uh, i mean if you want to to act against plastic pollution the only thing you can do is to stop plastic before it goes at sea so that's what we decided to do because uh, yeah obviously we are sailors we we have a boat so we could just put a net and try to pick up some trash but yeah obviously there is nothing and all the scientific communities knows about that so yeah that we we thought okay that's like pareto you know how can we have uh, the biggest impact with uh, the lowest uh, energy spent and money spent yeah i actually uh, agree with you because cleaning the ocean doesn't bring probably you know enough change and any solution as the plastic can be dumped in the ocean again and again and again so actually you as you turned you know like the purpose of your uh, of 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 the plastic odyssey it actually you know it can change something in the world you know like your approach is actually going to change something so it's really good thanks yeah we we hope so we hope so and yeah it's it's 20 tons per minute ending up in the ocean worldwide so oh my God. it's like a, as you say it's like a tap wide open plastic just flowing and flowing and if we uh, put all the energy looking at tiny tiny bits micro particles uh, in the pacific well won't change anything so every minute it's 20 tons of plastic so i think that, uh, that some, somewhere on your website it's equivalent to one garbage truck you know per minute so but how I, i mean how how is it possible that the garbage end up there i mean why why is not burned or recycled or recycled because me for example my plastic i'm going to throw it like in, in the garbage so how is it possible that there's so many plastic in the ocean well because uh there is no garbage everywhere i mean you cannot find uh bin uh, in some countries yet there is just simply no waste management uh And, and usually that's the poorest countries they don't just don't have access to to waste management and trucks to collect so the plastic just ends up in the nature and eventually in the ocean uh, when when there are cities close to the ocean but there is also one thing uh, in the richest country like Europe or the US those countries are exporting the waste to Asia to Africa and it's quite actually it's quite a lot the US only is exporting 1 million tons per year But that ends up in the ocean like we know that the US contribute to plastic ocean plastic pollution to approximately 1 million tons apologies i just i just wanted to to ask one simple question where, where people can have a look at this like uh, how how can they how can they reach this uh, information well there are uh, there are sci scientific studies uh, actually the, the one talking about uh, plastic export by the US Uh, was released this year. You can download download it. So guys, go to Google Scholar. <laughs> Google Scholar, search for it. Yeah, and we also 
we actually also uh, released uh, a document to summarize all the fake news on plastic pollution. So you can also go on our website and if, if you type like plastic pollution, fake news, plastic, plastic odyssey, you, you will find this document and we summarize all the scientific studies to just talk about what we know today, uh, what are the fake news, uh, and so you, you can read that. Sorry, did I did I catch you? Did you did you have something to add to to the previous? Uh, no, no, yeah, that, that's that's what I, I was uh, I was saying is just that I mean there are waste produced everywhere in quite a lot of countries in Asia and Africa. There is no infrastructures, no facilities to treat the waste, so it's just ending up in the nature in in open land land fields that, so that's where the pollution comes from it also comes a bit from uh, uh, the vessels fishing industry but it's approximately 10 percent so it's not the majority it's, it, it is uh, seven to ten percent but the majority is really the consumption of plastic everywhere basically and what what about the the movie Seaspiracy in Netflix? Is it, is it fake news or is it good to watch? I think it's good to watch um, to get a sense of all the problems, all the issue of industrial fishing. But in terms of plastic pollution, what is is saying, uh, what the movie is saying, is is quite fake. I mean, they are just taking figures uh, out of the blue, and it, they, it's it's not correlated to anything. So if you watch it rapidly, you have the impression that plastic pollution comes from the fishing industry. And as I said, it's 7%, 10%. So it it is true that it comes from fishing and from nets, uh, but only only 10%, not the majority. So that's what you you need to realize. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, because they said that the fishing nets are actually the the biggest problem, like in the ocean. They said that the fishing yeah. nets is like the, the biggest plastic pollution in the ocean. Yeah. And that's not true. Yeah, that's not true. It's it's like they had a look at one scientific study looking at one part of the ocean and just at what is floating at the ocean. And as I said, there is nothing floating. So you cannot say what is plastic pollution by looking at what is at the surface of the ocean because there is less than one person floating. So plastic pollution is something invisible. So it's not by looking at what is visible that you will get a sense of what plastic pollution is. I don't know if it's clear, but yeah, to, to, to summarize that, plastic pollution is on the, on the seabed or in microparticles, and the source of it uh, is really on land, consumption of everyone, and especially in low to middle income countries. So you said that one person of plastic waste floats. So doing my calculations, it means that 99% of plastic pollution is... Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's somewhere there, as you said. So does that mean that uh, humans, I mean, they will never get rid of plastics? Because, you know, as you said, in the ocean, in the air, in the water, uh, it means that in the animals, it means in our food, it means in our bodies. So what do you think, like, is it going to be, is this our future? Like our natural environment is, you know, like it's just... Classified or... Well, you, you, we can get uh, the impression of that because obviously the plastic lasts forever. I mean, we don't even know because it's been produced in 19, 1950s. So we don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, we, we have approximation that it can last for 100 years, uh, maybe 1,000 years. So we know it's there, it's going to stay there. And maybe the best things uh, we could do today is to let it uh, accumulate on the seabed and just, um, I mean, don't try to, to, to touch it. And at the same time, uh, avoid further pollution. I mean, for me, that's the best thing we can do because collecting plastic in the sea, I mean, that's, that's not a, a solution, I think. And uh, there, there must be a change. Like, for example, I, I imagine that in 90s, 50s, nobody cared about the environment. Nobody knew about climate change. They just did the material and they, they started promoting it heavily. The whole world started using it. But nowadays, when new material or, or a new new yeah new new material or packaging is uh, is developed, now it has to be tested, no? Or or socially or corporate social responsibility of those countries or or no sorry of those companies creating those products, they would usually run the environmental tests. Uh, do you know if this is required by law or how does this work? 
at least in Europe or France. Yeah, the thing, the problem with plastic is that it's it's quite a great material. Uh, like it, it sends a, a lot of needs, uh, especially in, like in, in, if you see it, medical applications or uh, quite a lot of applications where you, you don't have all the option today, and you need to to change really the use the way we almost the way we live to get rid completely plastic but i think it can be useful in some applications i mean not all of them single use plastic and there are a lot of plastic that are not needed but in some cases it can also it can be useful a lot i mean when you when you have a look at medicine again it's it's um, pretty good applications but we need to to think about the way we use this material and and yeah, we rethink um, the way we produce it, the way we design it, and and that's not easy. That, that's why we 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 have this difficulty today. Is that there is not a simple law that will uh, just solve the problem like that because each application has its problematic. That's the difficult part. Yeah, it's a it's a loop. But they are in France. They, there there is a, a law now like that is being enforced that is banning a lot of single use plastic. So it is changing at a regulatory level. Finally. It takes forever, but finally. Finally. But it's uh, it's yeah. been a long time too. <laughs> uh, Simon, so you've, you've been talking about the seabed uh, previously, and you've said that, well, it's it's well known fact that it is not 100% explored. It's true, right? But is there is there maybe some initiative, or do you believe that there could be some bacteria or organism actually consuming plastics? Yeah, I, I mean, we, 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 heard about, we heard about some uh, in lab, <laughs> In laboratory, some bacteria um, that are able to eat or decompose some types of plastic. So maybe, maybe uh, on, on the seabed, there will eventually there will be uh, a bacteria or I don't know eating the plastic. So you're taking their food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have one one question that is gonna sound controversial, but I wanna ask it in that way. Uh, because many people think this way. Uh, we have to be honest about it. So many regions that are affected by plastic pollutions are Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America. Why should we care? Because we are... Uh, uh, if if those countries, those areas are the, the ones with the lowest uh, waste management, we in Europe and, and the US are the countries with the highest consumption of plastic. So we consume much, much more than those countries. And then if it doesn't end up in the ocean, it still goes in landfill uh, or it's been it's going to incineration. And that's not a solution either. So, I mean, we are just focusing on plastic pollution in the ocean, but we need to see also all the different impacts that plastic can have. Uh, if we just put it in a landfill or if we just burn it. And so it, it's not because it's not going in the ocean, it's going to the bin and then it's going to, to be treated that it is recycled. So uh, we, as in the richest country, as big consumer of plastic, what we need to do is obviously to reduce as much as possible and avoid uh, the use of um, of plastic packaging because uh, it's everywhere and it's it, there is no solutions today uh, and there is no perfect solution we cannot recycle it over and over so we all need to care about it but obviously our focus is low to middle income countries because that's where we, we decided to act but doesn't mean that all the countries uh, have nothing to do. And also, like, I don't know if you saw, guys, but me on Instagram, I'm following an account. I think it's called Get, Get Wasted or something like this. And sometimes I see, like, um, you know, like a peeled banana or like a peeled orange in the plastic. Yeah. And I'm like, just what the, you know, like, what, why are they doing it? You know, like the orange is, you know, protected, you know, so why they peeled it off and put it in the plastic bag? I mean, it doesn't make sense. So Yeah, that's crazy. And it really depends on the culture, actually. I mean, there is um, a, a good study to, to have on behaviors and cultures. And that's what we are doing actually where we will go in in each country we will also have a research program to understand why people use plastic and, and what is the perception of, of waste and plastic in each country and obviously in asia you can find this kind of stuff because plastic is synonymous to uh, hygiene so we put plastic everywhere because it's clean and because it's it, it's seen as good to have plastic everywhere whereas in europe uh, we don't see the plastic as being 
hygienic or good. We see it as a waste, uh, as a pollution, but that's not the same in each country. So we really need to see why people in the US or in Asia use the plastic. And that's not actually the same uh, reason. But yeah, that's crazy to see that. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Let's move to the third part and the last part. And we're going to talk about uh, our personal experience with plastic pollution technology and future. So I would like to start with the personal experience. And um, so recently I was in Dubrovnik and seriously, every 30 centimeters on the beach was a cigarette. Like I'm not lying. Plastic pollution everywhere and a lot of young tourists. And the paradox is that the whole Dubrovnik is in the UNESCO. And uh, I actually have a conflict uh, with people smoking there and throwing away the cigarettes in the sand. Like what's really surprising that all the time when you tell these people what the problem is, the problem is they become offensive. They start to talk about their liberty and we can't have a conversation with them, you know, like a constructive conversation. And the same happens when you see someone to, to throw away, you know, something outside on the grass, like in the street. And every time when you ask people to do a collective effort, I just feel like that's impossible, like to talk with them. So, Simon, what do you think like we should do with those people? Should people like this be educated or punished or like what's the solution? Because I feel like sometimes there's no solution. Yeah, I, I don't believe really in like, punishment or shaming. Or, I mean, I mean, it can work. Probably, but maybe that's not the best way to change behaviors. And I think there are some other ways like nudge, you know, I don't know if you, you know, this kind of stuff where you can actually change people's behavior, but a different way by um, using tricks uh, to their mind and uh, just like, like adverts uh, are doing actually. Uh, adver advertising is using these kind of tricks uh, like to, to trick your mind and to to make you to push you to make decision and ch and change your behavior whereas you, you didn't want to do that at the first time like you want to didn't want to buy this product but we you, you are buying the product because we we know today how to trick the mind and how to push people to do something rather than another thing and you can use the same methodology to change behaviors but the soft way let's say not by punishing or shaming people because usually that's another effect that happen when you when you just shaming or, or pointing people saying uh, it's bad what you're doing usually people they just want to to do it again and again just because they don't like that you know they don't like to be so yeah it, it's, it's pretty hard i think there are a lot of uh social sciences and behavioral sciences to be to be done uh, again some research because we, we know little about that and we always focus on technologies but we can also focus on on how to change behavior because at the end of the day technology is good but if you don't work on humans that are using the technologies and, and that are consuming then you won't find the perfect solution i don't understand how you can be that soft like me once <laughs> I, I, I saw this man on the street like throwing away something on the you know just in the street I was just like sir you know there is like yeah, garbage no, that, next to you <laughs> that, that, that's really yeah it really annoys me a, a lot as well especially that I live in Marseille so you can imagine that <laughs> Mm -hmm. People are throwing waste everywhere, every time. And I'm just trying, sometimes I just want to take the waste and, and say, hey, you forgot that <laughs> you, that waste. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, you also need to look back and, and, and think, why are they doing that? You know, why are they throwing the waste? Is it because they are uh, nasty? Is it just because they, they, they want to pollute or is it something else? You know, I, I that's really something to think about. <laughs> I have maybe a good ex example. I have two experiences. Once when I was starting to, you know, tell people off be like uh, you shouldn't be doing this uh, which wasn't really working well because it was immediately a start of conflict they immediately started you know getting defensive and the second second thing that actually one of my exes told me and uh, it's, it's a great it's a great idea how to go about this when you educate by by giving an example so where they throw something on the on the ground i usually would pick it up smile at them and throw it in the garbage and, yeah you know it, it is it is a different approach and people are more receptive to it people are more when you're not creating conflict, you know, they're able to accept perhaps a little more. Yeah, I totally agree. There is one thing that uh, is uh, always above is social norms. Uh, and it, that's what social media also uh, uses. Uh, when when you show somebody doing something like somebody throwing in the bin, then you have you you want to do the same. And uh, if you if you show somebody throwing in the street, people we want to throw in the street. So that's also something. That's the kind of mind tricks i was talking about the social norm is is a 
good one, very good one. Like if everyone does something, I just want to, to follow. Yeah, we're, we're social animals. <laughs> Simon, we often say that millennials, so our generation of millennials, is the new generation, the new generation that can change the world. But can we really? Because can we live without waste, without plastic? Because seriously, I feel like I'm kind of pessimist in this one because I feel like most of the, you know, because when I look like all the all the food that we eat, all clothes, we don't want to think about climate change because it will add another problem to our lives. We put stories on our Instagram, but do we really do something in a real life? So do you think that our generation can really change the world? Yeah, that's a good question, man. <laughs> some days, I, I, some days I, I want to answer yes. Some days I'm like, it's not going to be fast enough. Yes. But, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we, we are doing, we are changing. When I, when I look back five years ago, when I started to uh, work on plastic pollution, I mean, nobody cares. And and no, like there is not a single day where you don't hear uh, an article or somebody talking on plastic pollution or climate change, even in business uh, newspapers, like the the one you will never see. Uh, usually, you, you you wouldn't have thought that they would talk about climate change or anything. And no, there is not a single day where you don't hear about that. So that's a good point. Like everyone is talking about that. That's like the first step. Now the second step is everyone has to act. <laughs> uh, and that's, I hope we are moving towards that. And I can see like youngest generation, uh, even people 10 years younger than me, they have a different mindset. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'm even I I think that I'm not radical enough when I when I look at younger generations. So when I see that I'm rather optimistic. Okay, I will I I will think about this stuff when I will be pessimist again. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to do something. Yes. At least something. <laughs> but yeah, re- re- remember what I was saying about social entrepreneurship and at the same what we are living today. We we need two ingredients. We need to be determined and optimistic always enthusiasm even if we don't know where we're going to even if we don't know how we're going to solve a problem like every day i have a lot of problems with the vessel with uh, fundraising and i don't know how i'm going to solve the problems but if i focus on the problems then i'm just going to fail so the only way that i can find solutions is just to think about optimistic stuff and keeping on being enthusiastic and then people are saying oh, okay it's gonna work so i'm gonna help him and it's always like that and simon when you look back at the covid crisis like why do you think that people like we were we were able to act so fast on the covid crisis but we are not able to act fast on a crisis for example like why do you think that's happening I, i think it's because of the urgency of the crisis i mean we are not able to 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 look very far away you know uh it's like when you are smoking you you think uh well okay it's in 20 years so i've got time so i think it's really that it's really dependent on the urgency of the problem when you face directly the problem then you react but if you don't feel any change in your life then you have difficulty to to act for the future. It's like when you have uh, homework to do, you know, it's like procrastination. <laughs> yes. It's exactly the same. I think mean, it's like, ah, oh, we have time. Okay, I will do that just before. <laughs> the yeah, and then the whole night you're just not sleeping, drinking Red Bull, you know, yeah. and like typing everything. <laughs> I think that's exactly the same, but like procrastination is everywhere. That's why we, we, we can't act now. So, I mean, what's the solution? Should we ma- should we market plastic pollution on plastic bottles, on plastic pollution as we do on cigarettes or some kind of taxation or like, what's the solution? Yeah, I I, I'm, I don't know. I think about it uh, quite a lot. Like, what is the solution? <laughs> the... <laughs> <laughs> you spent like eight years on this, so... <laughs> yeah, I still haven't found the perfect solution. I think there are many different ones and we just need to act as at each level, just not saying... A politician will do the work or it's a matter of corporates and big companies or, you know, you, you need to think that everyone has uh, to do, to change, take action. And it's just a multiplication of small initiatives in the end. And that's what I believe. Well, that's, that's what we are doing in Plastic Odyssey also, like not having big recycling centers, but a multiplicity of um, like a lot of small ones that will make a big difference. I have a few last questions. We're coming to an end. You've already touched upon this shortly but you've been you've been saying that there is a technology as a solution but it only works in combination with human effort as well 
Uh, so you're not a you're not a strong believer that to every human problem there is a technological solution. No, I, I'm not purely technological. Sorry. Yeah, you, no, you're right. I mean, I'm originally tech guy. Like uh, I've got an engineer degree, and I'm passionate about technology mm-hmm. and innovation. But the more I work on technology, and the more I realize the limits of it, and the need of understanding humans and social behaviors, even if it's not my background at all, but I can I can feel that. And what I realized is that a lot of engineers and, and tech guys know the limit of technologies and the ones that are the more optimistic about, yeah, technology is going to solve the world are the ones that don't, don't give a, a clue about what technology is. You know, they just, they are usually people that uh, uh, have no scientific background. So they, they just think it's like a magical stuff, you know, technology is like a magical wand and we can do a lot of, of, of things. But yeah, I think there is a limit all the times and technology is linked to energy and to resource. So the earth has limits. So in the end, you know, you, you have a lot of, of limits, even with the brightest minds. Yeah, so that's the, that's the technological part of it. And now, because uh, yeah, yeah I, I absolutely agree that the human element is huge uh, in this in this sense. And uh, many people should start, first of all, from themselves, because not everybody has the technological or financial capacity to influence the world, but they can start doing little steps, you know, and uh, on a global scale, it could be massive impact. But I would like to ask you if you can think of three recommendations that anyone can do as an uh, individual to maybe change the eco crisis. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot, but you're an engineer, you're an expert. Maybe you could give uh, three simple ones. Yeah. Or two. In terms of plastic, I mean, what everyone knows now, uh, what, what we can do like buy a, a reusable bottle or yeah. bring a mug with you. This is small stuff, but that can avoid quite a lot of packaging and, uh, and plastic. Buy in bulk, this kind of stuff. So that's for the plastic pollution. For the the climate solution, I think one of the biggest things you can do, and I, I'm not perfect on that, but is to eat less or no meat. I think that's... Yeah, that's that's the biggest impact you can have, eat local and stuff like that. We, we all know that and, and we are all facing our own difficulty to change when it comes to all this little action. You, I mean, you, you know you need to eat uh, less or no meat, but you still sometimes... Uh, uh, want to eat some so it, it's also interesting to to study ourselves you know uh, why I, I am behaving like that why do I choose that rather than that whereas I'm, I know I need to do something yeah I agree I think people need to get aware in making their decisions and maybe maybe get a little curious yeah. and question what am I doing and uh just a simple awareness of uh, what am I doing now causes some consequences. Yeah, I actually agree because I'm I, I'm a vegetarian, but I, I but I know it's not easy for everyone. So I think like you know like the small steps are good. But what's funny like b- before we started this conversation with you, Simon, like Dennis, Dennis he told me that he did he did like a big feast, <laughs> and he has never seen so much meat, you know, like in one place, and like he he ate so much meat that he really felt bad, so he didn't eat for two days afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I I usually I usually don't eat much meat. I, I, I eat meat once or twice a week. But after this feast, I had to take forty hours longer fast because my body my body was just giving up. <laughs> And there are actually ways to uh, make things easier. Like I've, I've got friends, they have a startup called Les Nouveaux Fermiers. They are making veggie, meat-like uh, stuff like sausages or chicken or even burgers. And it's, it looks amazing. I mean, it looks really like meat. It's even better than meat. That meat. And I think they will, uh, because they, they are doing that with good quality products and I think they will make a change really this kind of initiatives where you can still have a barbecue actually because you can bring your sausages instead of just um, I don't know vegetables to to the barbecue but it's not meat and that's a good step towards uh, becoming veggie or eating less meat I think it's a easy one easy one and uh, my fridge is full of that (laughs) (laughs) that's good (laughs) I have uh, two last questions, Simon, and one of them, the first one is very, maybe a little personal for me. I'm just going to give you a very, very short introduction. I'm a lawyer. I'm, I, have, uh, I have studied law and technology, so my, my expertise is in law and technology. 
can people join your team? Are you looking for interns? Uh, do, do you have uh, em, uh, employees? Can I, for example, as a lawyer or Carolina as a, as a manager uh, with, with uh, some marketing skills, can we also be of any help? Uh, can people join your team? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, we are always looking for uh, volunteers and, and sometimes uh, we have job opportunities. Uh, so the, the team is uh, growing slowly but surely and uh, as we will find new sponsors and partners and grow the activity we will have, obviously, uh, we will need people to to join the team and uh, yeah, obviously don't hesitate to look at the website and, and we, we, we release all the job opportunities and volunteering stuff, so definitely. So any millennials that are interested, go to www.plasticodyssey.org. Uh, organization or exactly <laughs> org <laughs> i don't know how to pronounce oh it my God. <laughs> <O-R-J>. <laughs> last question uh simon what would you recommend to our listeners something to read or uh to listen to or watch maybe do you have a uh, one simple recommendation I- i'm thinking i don't know why i'm thinking about a book i read recently uh it's, it's really not it's really like practical for entrepreneurs and to uh actually gain a lot of time uh it's called La Vinsa Kemer. I, I'm not sure there is a, an English version. I can imagine there is one. 25th hour. And that's quite great because it's been, it's been uh, uh, written by um, entrepreneurs. And you have lots, lots of tips uh, to save time. And, and when, when you are doing something like, uh, like that, a project or anything, it can be very useful. Hmm, that sounds good. That, that's a good recommendation. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Kaki. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> Thank you, dear listeners. Thank you for listening. Uh, so this one was with uh, Simon or Simon. <laughs> I'm pronouncing it uh, either way. So thank you so much uh, once again. And Simon is embarking on an adventure to solve the plastic pollution. It was cool to have you. And uh, if you guys are interested in, uh, in this project and would you like to learn something more, go check out www.plasticodyssey.org. <laughs> and if you enjoyed this episode or you would like to suggest some topics to us, shoot us a message on millennials.podcasty at gmail.com or on our social media. This podcast was made in cooperation with Theater Falangir and we would like to say hi to our theater friends and see you next time. Thank you, Simon, once again. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the team. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.